Good evening and welcome to this evening's RSU 14 Wyndham Raymond School District Board of Directors meeting. Today is February 28th, 2018. The time is 6.30. If I may have a um, roll call. Sure can. Kate Bricks. Present. Eric Colby. Jenny Cummins. Dawn Dillon. Diana Forslund. Here. Marge Gavoni. Here. Pete Hensler. Here. Hannah Kenny. Here. Scott McLean. Here. Genevieve here. Delano. <laughs> She's here. Here you are. Good time. If you if you will all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> We have no adjustments to the agenda this evening, so we'll open it for public input. However, there's no public. So moving right along, the first item on the agenda is the presentation of the 2018-19 district school calendar. And this evening we have Christine Hessler to present the information. She is our director of curriculum. Hello. Hello. Um, you have a bigger packet this year um, in front of you. And um, the first thing I did want to point out is the draft that was sent to you earlier in the week had one um, error on there, Veterans Day um, to be observed. Veterans Day next year is on a Sunday. So we would be observing it on a Monday. The draft calendar that went out to you earlier in the week had it on the Friday. That was a mistake, so we corrected that quickly. So the calendar you have in front of you is correct. Um, and once the board, at the time that you adopt the calendar, will send it back out on listserv with that notation, just in case a parent ran it off and stuck it on their fridge already, they would have the wrong um, Veterans Day observed. So the first thing. Um, so tonight in front of you, you have the proposed calendar for the 18-19 school year already. It gets a little crazy when we're already thinking about it. Um, for some of us that will still be here, Guinevere will not be here, that's okay. Um, also in your packet, um, you have a page of notes to explain each month how many student days there are in that month and how many staff days. Um, currently in our issue 14, we have 175 student days and 180 staff days. Out of those 180 staff days, three of those are in-service days, two of those are comp days for teacher conferences. Um, we have four early um, dismissals for middle school and high school planned for next year on Wednesdays. And our K-4 school in Raymond and our K-5 schools in Wyndham both have early release every Wednesday. Um, that has not changed. Um, so if when you take a look at this calendar, um, there is no drastic changes to this. It's pretty much mirrored from years past. Um, as a reminder to the public, um, and I do have this in your board packet, is the um, chapter 686 um, regional school calendar rules under public law. Um, basically to explain the process is RSU 14 works with five other school districts. All of these districts send their students to the um, vocational school in Westbrook. Um, under this um, law, we need to align our school calendars so that we have no more than five dissimilar days um, of impact of students. So the grid that you have in front of you, as well as the calendar, I thought it would be helpful this year um, because we always get the question, well, why can't we do this or why can't we do that? Um, if you look at the number of student days on that chart compared to the rest of the schools, um, we have students attend 175 days. Um, for those of you at home, Westbrook has 177 student days, Gorham has 175, and Scarborough and Bonnie Eagle have 177. Um, even as staff days, uh, we have the lowest number of staff days required. Um, they range from 182 to 183 in the other surrounding districts. So um, they're trying to fit in more days than we are when we address this calendar issue. Um, so um, if you look on here, we have um, outlined our opening day of school um, for all staff would be August 27th. And that week we would attend the first day for our students in grades one through nine is the 28th. Our first day for students grades 10 through 12 would be the 29th. And our first day of inviting our kindergartners to participate in school is the 30th. 
Um, there are all kinds of things that happen that week where kindergartners come in early with their parents on the, that first day before Thursday. Um, and then looking through, we have plotted out traditionally where the same in service days have fallen, aligned with the other districts. Um, our early release days are very similar. Um, and on the calendar as well, you'll see the first quarter ending dates for the high school, and you'll see the trimester end dates um, as well. So once again, we have a notified parents a year ahead of time when kindergarten screening will take place. I'll remind the public that when we do kindergarten screening, like we're we'll having very soon uh, next month, kindergartners do not attend school that day. Um, they are not required by law to attend the 175, so kindergartners have a little wiggle room. Our kindergartners don't come on those screening days when it's at their building as their teachers are screening the incoming students. So. Um, Ms. Jean, excuse yes. me, the, um, I'm looking on the early release. Yep. That is similar to what we're doing this year? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. This year, if you remember, high school had one more early release day due to the accreditation process. Mm -hmm. um, we've gone back to the four, so everybody is equal. The middle school, high school has the same schedule. Thank you. So last year, you allowed one more for that accreditation work, which is wrapping up, which is exciting. So. I'm happy this is just a, a look for this, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, to the board. They may have anything about the calendar. I just Pete. have a couple. Oh. No, I've already said something. Let me give you a turn. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so when the calendar is being worked on, do you all get together physically? Is this yes. email exchanges? Or? No, we physically get together. All right. Um, I, I will share with you this year, I was not physically in the room. Um, Rick Kirstein, who was with us one day a week, took on this project um, before he left um, and had the conversations with the other districts. Um, and then I picked it up once um, Rick is working full time for his other district. So, uh, All right. Were there any discussions in terms of starting after Labor Day? Because when this was presented last year, mm -hmm. a couple of the board members made it pretty clear that we yep. wanted that discussion to take place. And Rick did pose that question again. And the answer back from the other districts is we have too many days. If we start after Labor Day, we're ending way too late. So that's it was like four to one. So that's where we are. But again, it is your calendar to make recommendations or make changes. So Was there any discussion as to why I mean like what makes it what, what makes something too late I mean I realize that you weren't there so well in traditionally in past because I was there their thought if they wait to start school on Monday the 4th um, they've already lost three instructional days so that pushes them out three more days if you look at the end of their calendars our last day of school let's say we have no snow days ever uh, we would be getting out June 7th um, their dates, you would add like three or sometimes four days longer on that to even start before snow days hit. Um, and they're not willing at this point to consider it, that piece. Um, but again, as a board, this is your calendar and your community. So I, I have to present to you what the findings were, but again, you as the board can make your decisions on what you would want to do. So what would happen if we wanted to change it? and we're dissimilar to our other surrounding so groups what, we work with. Cor correct. So I would think what would happen, the same thing that happened to PATHS for a few years, is that they couldn't get their calendars to align, and they were notified by the Department of Education that they needed to get them aligned together. And they're given so much time. Um, and then if I look at the statute, there is a possibility of them withholding some funding. Um, but you know, <coughs> Sandy and I had talked about that, too. At, I'm not quite sure they would get to that length, but. So let me get this straight. So if just by bumping three days off of August, the calendar wouldn't, you wouldn't keep all of these in-service dates the same? No, we could keep those the same. So theoretically, wouldn't the calendars be somewhat aligned? It's just the start time would be slightly different, But that's correct? three days that we would not be in session, so those are three days that are counted against us. So if we decide not to, if we decide not to start till after Labor Day, mm -hmm. that is three dissimilar days, and we're allowed five. Do we know how many we have if we, like, as it right stands right now? Right now, we have four. As it stands right now, you ha we have four dissimilar days. The problem is, is if you look at Gorham and um, I believe at Scarborough, they have more in-service days. And so I know in October in Gorham, they have two in-service days. They align with one of us for one, but they have another one later in the month that no one aligns with that counts as a day. So it's that pull of they need to get in 
I believe if I look at Gorm, and I'll just use Gorm as the example. Uh, Gorm has six in-service days. So they have to fit in six days without students in the calendar. They align with two with us. There's four other days that they're not aligned with. So we can blame it on Gorm if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing too is uh, from going to the advisory meetings at the technical schools, um, we we could if we didn't go to either of the technical schools we could ha we could start and stop as long as we had the right. amount of right amount of calendar days, but if we change ours that's three days our students would not be there and that would put them up to seven. Right, and that's, so that that's would the put point everybody, behind this. The that point behind this out. whole chapter six eighty six is that it's for the career and technical schools. for the career and technical schools. So, so their first day of school at the career and technical schools is the same is the same usually 29th. they start and that's the hard one we tried to we tried to pin them down to say are you starting that Tuesday are you starting that Wednesday they usually start on that Wednesday because most high schools have freshmen only coming on the first day so those kids that go to the CTE schools aren't even affected yet and then they try to open the next day so any other questions I think the calendar. I think the calendar is great. Um, this is not a question. Oh. Um, I think the calendar is great. The one thing I really like about the calendar, I can remember a few years ago, that a lot of staff had an issue with the fact that the vacation, the vacation times, were too long. When you got around, I think it was between. I don't know if it was between Christmas and New Year's. Yeah. I forget what it was, but it was almost like two weeks. Yeah, the way the calendar, the way, way the Christmas fell. Right, yeah. the way that the calendars were, right. and it created a lot of problems for the for the teachers because the students were, it was like getting them back after being right. out all summer, you know. Yeah. So I, I think it's spread out. And that's hard really because nice wherever now. Christmas falls, right. you have yeah. to like, right. so how right. far do you go before right. Christmas break? And it, it yeah. There are some cyclical, cyclical years that, 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 happens that happens to, like all of a sudden we get that, okay, this is the year you get the two weeks. It's a weird one, yeah. yeah. March, we can't really help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, I understand the concern about starting before, um, what is it called, Labor Day? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 um, but I also understand the complexity of, you know, student our student instruction for a vote kids okay. and if you add on at the end of the calendar year not even thinking about if, if you have to have a joint calendar I understand the concern from the other districts um, which leads me to my comment um, when I look at the number of calendar day per district chart this is just a comment that I think I've made over the years when I look at the in-service days um, other than Scarborough with three, we only have three in-service days. Granted, we've got this late start, but um, I'm hearing consistently over and over and over again, and just having gone through some information on the strategic plan minutes that I've been reading, that there simply is not enough time mm. for our staff to do um, some behind-the-scenes work. And I realize, I'm just throwing this out there again, I said it last year, and I know it um, involves a great deal of money, but at some point um, we have to support our staff with the work that we expect them to do and allow them to have a day to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, at some point we're going to have to bite the bullet on that because we, between proficiency and Lucy Calkins and mm -hmm. now the math, I mean, there are a plethora of initiatives that are going on that our staff are really excited about but really don't they're here to teach so we've got to give them the opportunity to really um, sink their teeth into some of these things to assist our, our students not that they aren't but to augment so that's my comment again this year and Kate I also added some districts have been creative in how they do their early release late arrival things like I never knew Westbrook actually got out every Wednesday an hour early and that's built in PD time and that's K through 12. Oh wow. So wow. I, that's why I put that on there as well just for you to see that that some people I know in my children's district it's late arrival and they have nine of them which is stifling sometimes as a parent <laughs> but that's they're getting the student day in but they start the day with professional development um, you know and I know we have our every Wednesday but it, there are some 
pieces in here that people are starting um, to do. Scarborough just added the late start pieces in there as well um, as a way to not add another day, but to add more time um, mm -hmm. for teachers to attend to the work that they're doing. So. I think it requires serious consideration. Thank you. Okay. Do you guys have any questions? Any additional? No. I have, I have just one. Well, I just, I just had a comment, too. I'm glad that you explained why, because it is my preference to start after Labor Day as well. Mm -hmm. But when you look at what these other districts have for the number of days they're trying to fit in versus us, I can see from their perspective it, it doesn't work because they're almost having to fit in a whole other week. Right. So. We did have one that wanted to start the week before that. Huh? Like earlier, they wanted to go oh into, gosh. and we just were all like, no, no. That's, yeah. So that, that there, there's that momentum of one district wanting to actually go before that date that you see there, um, the week earlier, and we had to say, yeah, no, no, no. You can bring your own staff in there, but we're not bringing in kids that early. So, um, yes, um, kind of like in, in line with what Kate said, and you pointed out uh, what Westbrook is doing to. That one hour every Wednesday would, I, this is hypothetical because yeah. I don't really know. Um, I don't see it as being much of a an impact because that's our early release day for the kids. So from, from a transportation standpoint, I don't think it would mess up, you know, where the buses were or when. In fact, we'd probably put the buses a little <coughs> closer to being able to do one and then come back and get the others. But it, that's something. I think it would be worth and as long as we did her, uh, yeah and as long request. as we did it on Wednesday right we're right. fine that's the one thing when this law came out that the vocational school said you because to try to align every early release day late arrival all that stuff they said as long as it's a Wednesday and we provide transportation for the students you can doesn't matter if those line up so you can see I mean how to line up nine ten whatever so we all if you remember the first year we had to do this we lost those two days at Thanksgiving that used to be just staff. Remember, kids used yeah. did not didn't used to come, and everything went to all early releases instead of being on a Friday became on a Wednesday. So mm -hmm. as long as it's a Wednesday, we would fit be, be, you know into the par parameters. So. Okay. One more. Yes, sir. Do you know when the other districts will be, their boards will be voting on these calendars? Um, two have already been posted. Scarborough and Bonnie Eagle already adopted their boards and they're on their websites. So one, I believe they were both in February. I think Scarborough's went lat two weeks ago and Bonnie Eagle did theirs beginning February. It was already posted because I got an alert, an alert that it was up. So. And typically, when do you guys normally meet? We meet in the beginning of January <clears throat> to start the process. Beginning of January? Yep. I'm pretty sure Westbrook is on it only because um, Westbrook Regional Vocational is connected to the school. Right, so I know they have their in line. They might not have officially board. voted, right. but That's, they will. Yeah, the, it, until it's officially voted, right. then um, it doesn't get posted. Right. So. Are we ready to vote? I'll just make a closing comment just for sure. myself. I mean, I do have a problem with our calendar being dictated by other towns. So I realize that we're in this arrangement. Um, but the fact that they choose or elect to have extra days and that impacts our ability to manage the district the way that we would like to, perhaps, or that some of us would like to, I do have a problem with that. So I will actually not be supporting the calendar. Okay. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, can we find out legally do, don't we legally have to belong to a CTE. yeah a CTE school so it isn't a choice of we could be a, a standalone so in in a, in a way they're not really dictating the other towns or not it's that we all have to be within that five day thing is dictating that we all have to agree I guess I mean I'm not going against what you said, Pete, but I think there's more, I think it's a bigger picture. Anyway. Yeah, but it's harder to have yeah. similar days when they have 184, like Bonnie Eagle or whatever, and yeah. they have 180, so. Well, pass with 13 schools has a much harder time than we do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All 
right. so again if, if I'm kind of hearing and if it's the board's wishes when I go again next January if you would like me to again say can we you know if we if we started after Labor Day could we arrange I can try it again I mean Pete I can keep going at that piece if that's the, the wish of the board yeah because so. I don't see it ever changing I mean it feels right. like we're handcuffed right and kind of yeah and unless we initiate something mm -hmm. then it's just going to be business as usual year after year after year except for i don't know that just personally i'm comfortable voting against it at this point because then we send it back and really for what because then we'll be so over the five dissimilar days and i'm really not clear what happens you know i wouldn't want to lose funding because of it if that's what happens if that's what happens yeah i'd like to have more well, information well, on that you know what I mean? So anyway, all right. If I could have a motion. I move to approve the 2018-19 district school calendar. Second. All those in favor? All those opposed? How many are there of us? Three, four, five, there's six of us. <laughs> oh, are you taking notes? Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you get that? No. There was okay, four and two opposed. Do you need the four, who the four are? Because of the count? You know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Christine. You're Thank welcome. you. All righty. Next on the agenda, we have a special guest this evening. Mr. Bill Braun is here. He's the town manager of Fry Island, and he wanted to come and have an open discussion with the board about um, possible plans for Fry Island. Hey. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for uh, having me tonight. Um, I'm here to uh, see if we can, uh, what mechanism there might be to pursue uh, a discussion or a process in which Fry, by which Fry Island might uh, be able to join the uh, RSU 14 of course subject to its uh, being able to withdraw from SAD 6. As you know, you may, everybody's aware, I think Fryland is actually a town. And um, we, uh, as at the time of secession from Standish, uh, there was a memorandum of understanding which said that uh, Fryland would remain, uh, quote, um, roughly quoting part of the uh, uh, SAD 6. The Bill of Secession said that uh, uh, Fryland will remain as part of SAD 6 until such time as it elects to withdraw in, a, in, a, in, a, in a compliance with applicable law. Um, some four years, to 2000, that was in 1998. In 2002, uh, Fryland elected to withdraw. I should uh, uh, back up a little bit and tell you that the reason that Fryland uh, wanted to secede from Standish, there, there were uh, multiple facets uh, to that, but uh, as I remember, uh, and uh, was that uh, there, it was just too much money for too little service. Uh, Fryland paid a lot of money to Standish, didn't get anything back. Um, and fast forward to 2002, the island elected to uh, try to withdraw from SAD 6, not because of any wish to avoid support. Uh, of public education or a particular school system, but because of the sense that there, it was too much money for too little value, uh, notwithstanding the value that's that's um, you know created for the district students by Fry Island's uh, contribution, uh, financial contribution, uh, the fact that Fry Island had no students in the system whatsoever, and in, like, in all likelihood, may never. Uh, it was felt that the funding formula did not adequately uh, account for that. And any attempts to negotiate with the district at that time or since uh, have uh, not uh, surprisingly failed, no fault on anybody's part. It's just that there's no incentive for the district. The, the district holds all the cards and there's no incentive for the district to negotiate with Fry Island. Um, in response to that attempt to withdraw, the legislature rushed uh, to pass an emergency legislation, which was a, a called LD500, an amendment to the Bill of Secession. And, and that's, that's relevant in a different context, but an amendment to the Bill of Secession 
which um, uh, said that, wait a minute, uh, Fry Island cannot uh, withdraw from SAD 6 uh, until such time, it, 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 except by except by uh, further amendment to this law. In other words, we'd need, the island would need an act of the legislature in order to be able to withdraw. Uh, Fry Island doesn't comprise much of a constituency for the legislature, as you might imagine, and has limited ability to um, affect the course of events there. It also uh, has no practical influence uh, over the, S the SAD-6 in that at present it's going to change on June the 30th, but not in, a, not in a meaningful way, not effectively change. But as of now, Fry Island has one vote out of 980-something or 990. It's a huge number of votes. And so the Fry Island has, for practical purposes, zero ability to influence uh, the course of events within the SAD. So um, for several reasons, uh, partly in order to gain some traction to negotiate a more uh, tenable cost structure within the framework that as I've said, uh, the island, the, the, the community mm -hmm. fully acknowledges and accepts and embraces its responsibility to support public education. And there's no wish to avoid paying school taxes and no wish to, um, uh, well, I should say parenthetically also, no wish to cause precipitous harm to the district itself. Uh, there's been some, to that the present district, there's been some, um, uh, information that's been communicated in, in the past that says that the district would be adversely impacted. That's probably not true. This is really not about education. It's about funding. Um, the district would presumably have its same funding. It would just come from different sources. Less would come from Fry Island in one scenario, and more would come from the other towns who actually send students there and actually have some costs and some services that are attendant uh, to the taxes that it pays. So in conjunction with Fry Island's wish to, you know, find a more appropriate way, uh, a sort of more tenable way for its, uh, its uh, taxpayers, and perhaps even a more viable way should, you know, global warming continues and the island becomes year round, uh, uh, should we have any prospective students? The other dimension of this is it's a, very close to a physical impossibility for a student from Fry Island to attend normal classes at SAD 6, given the location of the island and given the location of that district's uh, educational outlets, schools. Um, so, you know, a couple of, uh, so the, it, it's a funny context because the, this is now, um, I should tell you that uh, I met uh, the last time and the first time with with uh, Diana and uh, Marge and, and uh, Sandy uh, in early December to broach the possibility of Fry Island joining RSU 14. Um, and the reason for the uh, Fry Island's wanting to do that, uh, there were sort of several dimensions to it. Um, one is um, that we did want to have a viable alternative um, approach to supporting education sh should we be allowed to withdraw from SAD6. We wanted to um, act on our commitment to, uh, we felt like this was, a, being part of a regional school district was probably the most viable way for us to uh, to act on, on the premise that we need to support education. We're not trying to skate on that or, or uh, avoid that responsibility. So, um, and, and because um, it, we felt like it would, it would, it would A, give us some credibility, not necessarily in this order, but would give us some credibility. It may make sense in that um, there's a, there are a lot more geographic synergies between RSU 14 and Fry Island. We could actually send students there some, here someday if, if it ever became possible. And uh, we share other services with at least Raymond and a zip code uh, with Raymond. Um, and there, there's, there's a, a lot of, just a lot of synergistic activity there. So um, it, it seemed prudent uh, in the context of this whole thing to find a landing place should we be allowed to withdraw and at the same time perhaps uh, lend some impetus or get some traction uh, uh, to the withdrawal process in that we have uh, a, a viable alternative and we have another district whose 
uh, interests are now uh, could be at stake uh, in the process. Um, Fry Island in no way, uh, it, we're, not, we're not district shopping. Uh, we've been with the uh, SAD6 for, um, since the island was populated, uh, as far as I know. Um, the, the context, the immediate context is that uh, we, I don't know how close I have to stand at this thing uh, for people to hear, but the immediate context is that um, when Fry Island elected to, uh, to we filed a petition to withdraw under Chapter 1466, which is the present legislation allowing, present law allowing uh, the schools, uh, 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 municipalities to withdraw from regional districts. Some of you are probably familiar with that. Um, this, the SAD6 has uh, filed suit uh, claiming that that, that peti petition to withdraw is unlawful in view of what I just call LD500, the private and special law that amended the Bill of Secession so that Fry Island could not withdraw. I can't get into the specifics of the legal arguments on both sides and it wouldn't be in a, 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 any interest here anyway. So, uh, but it, it it's a funny situation because I don't want to waste people's time and energy if it's going to become an impossibility forever for Fry Island to withdraw. But on the premise that there's some appreciable, non-trivial likelihood that Fry Island will be able to withdraw, it would make some sense for us to pursue discussions with districts that might actually, um, uh, you know, provide a, it may, pro may be a win-win for, for us in another district. The context is that we don't have any preset notions as to, um, you know, uh, what we think is a reasonable um, amount of uh, support to provide for a school system, given that the, the town has no students. Um, right now, as you may be aware, Fry, uh, uh, SAD6 is one of two districts in the state of Maine on which, which have the funding formulas based on uh, valuation rather than percent of student enrollment. Um, and the reason for that is uh, uh, SAD6 has Fry Island and SAD44, which is the other district, has Newry. Uh, Newry has, I'm told, some students, Fry Island has none. The effect on these uh, districts, if, uh, if, if it went to all enrollment, was that those towns would pay, Fry Island and Newry would pay very, very little uh, property tax. I apologize for this. I've got, I didn't even know I had this phone with me. I don't know how to turn it off, so I have to put up with it. Um, so anyway, um, so, so that, you know, they, that would, the Fry Island's, uh, is, to be specific, Fry Island's uh, sh uh, contribution to SAD6 would go to zero. Well, nobody ever intended that. There's a lot of ground between what we pay now and zero, and there are parenthetically a lot of other towns in the state of Maine I suspect that have reasonably high valuations because they have a lot of waterfront property, which also means they have a lot of seasonality, which means that they don't have as many students per, uh, per, you know, per household on average as other towns might have. And they reap the benefit of that in the sense that their, uh, their contribution to school taxes, uh, to school funding is based on enrollment. Uh, we, we're all the way at the bookend, but that doesn't mean the whole thing has to flip the other way. There ought to be some ground in between. So from our side, there's a lot of ground between uh, nothing and what we pay now, and from the side of a recipient district, depending on what the issues and the, and the, the, you know, the considerations that you might have might be, you know, anything more than zero, you know, it may be that you would have a, some sort of fiduciary responsibility to consider that given that it comes without any costs or any additional hassle. Uh, so, and, and, you know, it didn't, it, 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 I don't think that um, there's any basis to believe that, uh, it, it seems that right now the, 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 general, the general ethic with respect to municipal support of education is that there ought to be some level of, of self-determination allowed that is, uh, because that's what keeps everything on a cost-effective level, keeps everybody honest. If, if municipalities can decide how they want to approach education best and most cost-effectively, that probably creates a, a much more efficient delivery system across the board. So as far as the general ground rule for that, it makes sense that there ought to be some sort of 
uh, the potential for s municipal self-determination with respect to education. I know uh, very, very peripherally that th there's been some back and forth with uh, between Raymond and Wyndham in terms of withdrawing and not withdrawing, and that's all been a very constructive process. That's the process, as it, 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 at least it seems to me from the little I know about it. it it's led to a, apparently to a good place. Um, we would not be opposed, to, in, full, in full candor, we would not be opposed if, the, uh, if it led there with respect to SAD-6, but the history with SAD-6 uh, I don't want to prejudice the process because uh, I'm the one that was saying that we, we really need to approach this with fresh eyes and collaboratively, and I still believe that. But uh, the history has been such that it doesn't look like that's likely at all. And uh, so our, um, our wish would be to start discussions in, in honest and open and good faith discussions with this district with an, with, on the premise that perhaps we may be able to join it uh, when and if we're allowed to withdraw from SAD-6. I do not know how the course of this, li of this uh, litigation will go. Um, I, I, I can't place any bets. I, I, I have no idea how the courts will respond. It may be over very quickly, and we may be in the SAD in perpetuity unless we uh, decide to take other measures that are not obvious to me right now. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, it may be that the uh, court finds that uh, we do have the right to withdraw, in which case um, we would be very interested in continuing discussions with RSU 14. So I say all that because I want to be serious and earnest about pursuing the viability of, of joining RSU 14 should we be allowed to withdraw from SAD 6. But at the same time, I also don't want to embark on an effort that, would, that just wastes everybody's time for the term. We can't do it. So that's kind of where we are now. And um, what I really wanted to do is just take the next step following the, the prelim very preliminary conversation that I had with, uh, with Sandy, Marge, and Diana uh, two months ago or so. So that's I, – I'm happy to take any questions or open some conversation or deal with this further in any way that you want or just let it sit so you can deliberate and however you want to handle it. Just to be clear, so you started the withdrawal process with SAD-6? Yes, and but at the end of October, uh, no, back up, uh, we, uh, uh, Fry Island, where there was a, a citizen petition withdraw on Fry Island that was approved by the voters in an election uh, in October. In late October, that was sent in accordance, you know, just following law to um, to the Department of Education, uh, who uh, reluctantly allowed it to go through uh, and let the withdrawal process start. When the SAD um, filed its complaint, uh, the, the department allowed that process to stop. Um, Fry, Island, uh, Fry Island filed a a, um, a uh, request to continue that process, mainly because it would provide a forum and an opportunity for negotiation uh, between us and the SAD. The SAD objected to that and prevailed. So the, the, the Department of Education has basically shut it down, or it's not, it in effect, shut it down by not compelling the district to continue with the withdrawal process. To, uh, yeah, for those of you that don't know, what I mean by that is um, when you, uh, once the petition to withdraw is, is filed and approved, uh, the, uh, the filing town has to appoint, uh, there, there's a withdrawal committee that's appointed, three members of which are appointed by the municipality. Uh, one member is, is appointed by the school board and has to be one of the, the uh, board members representing that municipality. That was easy in this case because we have only one. And so that member was, was supposed to be appointed by the, uh, uh, by the school board, by the, by the board of the regional school uh, unit, and uh, our selectmen appointed the remaining three. The next step is that the uh, the chairman of the, of the uh, board of the school district is supposed to call a meeting of the withdrawal committee, even though it's, you know, it's, the committee's comprised mostly of uh, people from the municipality, but the, um, the rationale, the reason for that is just to elect, allow them to elect a chair 
And again, those of you that are familiar with this process know that, that then there's a, there's a sort of a, there's a set of criteria that you have to meet. You have to make sure you have a viable education plan. You have to make sure that you know, there's agreement in the financial uh, 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 needs of both parties are met, et cetera. So there's a lot of stuff you have to go through. But um, uh, you know, Frylin never had any wish to pull the rug out from under the district. Uh, a lot of the uh, SAD, that is. There ought to be some way to uh, provide a soft landing, for want of a better word. Uh, but but uh, so far, we've been through the 1301 process, uh, which led, uh, uh, unfortunately, nowhere. And um, because Frylin has no cards, has no traction, and so. Um, we, um, at this point, are hopeful that the litigation will be successful so that we can um, join uh, a school district, whether it's SAD 6 or some other, another district, like RSU 14. And by the way, we're not talking to any other districts except RSU 14. Uh, but uh, that would um, just put us on a more tenable footing, both financially and with respect to any future students. So. Um, I guess I'm, I, I want to keep moving this process forward so you, both, of, both parties, could start thinking about the terms under which we might want to go forward, if at all. Uh, um, so that, that's pretty much. I don't, want, I don't mean to be forward, but how much do you pay to SAD? Oh, no, it's, not, it's, it's public information. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I, I should have brought that with me exactly, but it's. It's about a uh, million five hundred and forty-eight thousand, something like that, this Thank year. You. Million five hundred thousand. Now, do you have any board representation with SAD six? Yes, we have one board member. You have one board member. We have out one of board member out of, I think it's nineteen now. It's going to go down to eleven. Don't hold me to that, but it's it's. Uh, wow. And, and we have one. And the way it's set up now is. Each board member, depending on the population of their town, has a certain number of votes. And so the votes add up to 980-something. I should have brought yeah. those numbers, and we have one. Uh, and uh, it'll go da down from <coughs> Fry Island having, uh, being one of uh, whatever it is, 17 or 19 members, and down to Fry Island being one of 11. But its voting power will remain the same. It will have precisely no influence over, um, over the affairs. All right, and you said you're not currently speaking to any other districts, but have you identified any other districts you may have synergies with other than RSU 14? Well, well, no, uh, we haven't. There may be others, but um, right or wrong, one of the key features or one of the you know key determinants for us was geographical, geographical proximity. I mean, we have to take seriously the notion that this is about education. I mean, uh, and that should at some point for Island ever uh, have an opportunity to educate its kids. And, and again, the other reason is that uh, I don't want to rule that out. It's just we haven't done it. We haven't thought about it. Well, the obvious place to come was here. Um, because as I said, we share emergency services and um, uh, with Raymond and, and some other things. And it, 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 um, it just seemed like a natural. So no, we haven't so far. It doesn't mean we won't, but we haven't. Right. All right, good. Yeah, and that just brought me to another point, just more of a comment that um, while there would be no cost to the district initially if there's no students, um, if there ever got to a point where there were students on Fry Island, then it falls on the district to be able to provide transportation, and that creates a, I don't know how much of a cost it would create for us. So. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 would, I guess I would address that two ways. One is to say that whatever agreement uh, was made, um, could certainly anticipate that and provide and, and provide a framework for how that would happen, number one. Number two, uh, I had, I've been here through a good bit of the winter, and I have to say that the most school buses I've ever seen uh, in one place at one time have been on Raymond Cape Road. Uh, that leads me to believe that there's probably transportation or access to transportation that could be done. I don't mean to flip about that, but I wouldn't be too worried about that at this point. I think we could probably set up a framework uh, within which uh, that would anticipate and accommodate any students that Fry Island might have. Yeah, I was going to say, I know what? we have uh, several full-time students that live way down mm -hmm. at the end. I'm not even sure how it's part of Raymond anymore, <laughs> how far they are. 
Um, what is the winter population on Fry Island? Well, that's hard to tell. Um, you know, it's, it's unavoidably seasonal. Uh, I can give you some things to let you triangulate at that. We have uh, approximately 536 cottages. Um, and uh, we have uh, at, at, well, it's a thousand, but we, we have a, what's called a Board of Island Trustees, which is the largest governing body that we can pull together, which is uh, two members of each, uh, of, of each household. We have 530 some households. Um, you know, and that, that's the core. I mean, that's the thing you have to work off. Uh, 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 many, we, we do have, I should tell you that, you know, uh, demographically, uh, Fry Island is not the uh, sort of playground of, of rich out-of-staters that uh, don't want to pay school taxes that it's been portrayed to be. It was established sometime in the mid to late 60s as a community and um, has been traditionally mostly um, working class people. It's uh, broadly defined. It's been uh, plumbers, electricians, firemen, police officers, teachers. Um, it, as a lot of communities have, it's, it's been diversified uh, to some extent over the years. But um, the appeal that Fry Island had for many of us was that it's the only place that was regionally available in where somebody that on a, a police officer or fireman's salary could afford uh, water-based property, property uh, on or near the water. Uh, the trade-off you made for that was you could only be there six months out of the year and you had to take a ferry to get there. But for some people, that was a reasonable trade-off because it was the only way they were going to get any kind of vacation home uh, because uh, property was inexpensive. And we still have, uh, why am I going into that? So we have kind of a bimodal population. We still have a lot of uh, seniors and advanced seniors uh, who uh, were part of that original cadre of people. Um, their, their children are grown. Uh, the island during the summer is home to a lot of their uh, grandchildren. Uh, and, yet, and now we, but we also have uh, younger, you know, younger families, younger people with younger kids. Uh, so it's a, but it, but it's a, it, you know, it, it's it's not, I, I would say, uh, categorically by any means a um, an island full of full of, uh, you know, wealthy out of staters who don't care about Maine. A lot of people on the island make a pretty significant investment in Maine. A lot of them originally were from Maine, and a lot of were from this area. Some have gotten older and have moved to warmer places in the summertime, but. Many of the original Fry Island people came from, from Maine, and many still do live in Maine when they can't live on the island. Um, How many voting residents do you have? Again, it goes up and down depending on who is, um, um, you know, how people have moved. But at this point, I think we have uh, 186 registered voters, something like that. Don't, uh, I can get that exactly if you need it, but it's on that order. I didn't bring it with me. It's about 180 registered voters. How, how frequently does that ferry run? Uh, it, it has a different frequency during what we call low season, high season. High season begins, as you might expect, uh, basically when school's, school lets out and runs um, through Labor Day. Um, during the high season, it runs, depending on the time of day, every 15 minutes there are two boats and they run every 15 minutes. Uh, other times when it's running, it runs every half an hour. Uh, when things get really busy, uh, one boat or two boats will just shuttle and they don't run on a schedule. They just go back and forth and bring people over and back as, as, as they can. Uh, that doesn't happen all that frequently because the schedule runs take care of it most of the time. But it's a pretty, it, it's not at all like the, um, like you might imagine from the Casco Bay Islands or anything like that. You can pretty much come and go at will. What about frequency in the winter? Oh, right. Uh, ferry shuts down for public use as of now in the winter, uh, usually the first uh, Monday in November. There's no transit back and forth in winter time at all. One more. You got running water out there right now? Not during the winter. No. Okay. We uh, the, the once the ferry shut down, 
the water system is uh, drained and, and blown out for obvious reasons. We, it, we, it, it can't freeze, we can't let it freeze during the winter. It wouldn't be used. So recognizing that the 1.5 um, <clears throat> is really the impetus for the withdrawal process, mm -hmm. correct? Um, there must be some discussion, and I realize that there's a negotiation process um, should you go with someone else, but within your constituency, there must be some parameter for what you're looking for. We, we don't at this point, very candidly, we don't. Um, it, it's, uh, we have a general sense that, uh, uh, I mean, full disclosure, it's uh, the, the percentage of Fryland's budget that this occupies is probably no uh, worse than the percentage of most towns' budget that's occupied uh, by education, but most towns get something for that. Um, they get some value delivered, they get their kids educated, um, and Fryland doesn't get any of that. Uh, but we do, I, at this juncture, we, we do not have any, it's not gonna be worth the effort to pay, you know, a million four hundred ninety-nine thousand. Uh, but uh, our feeling is that if uh, that a, a district which is, you know, with however much difficulty it has, which is um, funding um, a, a very good educational program and managing to do that, that, uh, that almost anything above that would be, would be desirable. That doesn't mean that we want to just, you know, say, you know, we'll, We'll give you some, we'll come in and we'd be willing to contribute some very, very small or nominal amount to the school district. Um, but uh, we do not at this point. Uh, we would probably have to have some internal discussions about that. We formed a committee which we call the Education Steering Committee uh, in order to get a, a, a little more broad uh, base of input into those kinds of uh, considerations and also as uh, sort of the, to broaden the base of people who are um, just engaged in the process and, and able to, uh, to interact with other people and communicate information. So we have set that up uh, with the idea that we would s sort of address, it's a, kind of a chicken and egg situation. Um, I think it's probably good news that we don't have any hard and fixed uh, uh, rules. We, we, frankly, we want to join a, a district uh, where <coughs> we can uh, where our contribution would not be so onerous um, and that we feel that there are, uh, there are other synergies and other ways to share value, um, which we, as I say, we already have in place. Uh, but uh, I get a long-winded way to say no, but we don't have any firm ideas at this point. But it's too much right now. Too much right now. All I know is what we pay right now is too much. We all acknowledge that zero is way too little and somewhere in the, in the middle is uh, where we want to be depending on uh, you know, what was negotiated and what people saw as in their interests. Um, it's our responsibility to see if we can um, support education in a more tenable way to Fry Island and at the same time support education in Maine at large. I would say it's probably your responsibility to figure out whether, you know, if there's a basis on which Fry Island could can be part of and contribute to RSU 14 that worked for you. I mean, mm -hmm. no. I understand. So, are you looking from us? Are you looking for uh, some sign that there is some interest there, or you want us to? What exactly are you looking for? Well, that's a good. Us? That's a, that's a good question, March. Uh, I, I deliberately felt that it was too early to come in here with a proposal, because even if we had one, because it would just be it just be a bridge too far. It's too far to go. Uh, but what I, I do think, you know, there's, there's a number of reasonable processes that could be uh, set forward. I mean, you all could uh, uh, meet together and decide that, it, in principle, this is something you'd like to pursue as far as it goes, uh, and then, uh, s you know, form some kind of a working group or put some kind of parameters together that you consider to be uh, the, the conditions under which you would consider uh, us joining. And, and we could do the same, or we could, you could form some subgroup or a committee of the whole, and we could sit down and simply form a working group and make a list of issues on the whiteboard 
and determine collaboratively how we're uh, going to address those issues. We're open as far as process goes. I think the only <coughs> ground rule that we would propose is that it be uh, open, uh, collaborative, and, and, and based on common interests. Having gone through a withdrawal process, um, just at first blush, and I appreciate you coming forth with all of the information because it's been very informative and a lot of food for thought. Um, at first glance, for me personally, um, before it would seem reasonable to start at our end a dialogue, I personally would like to see the outcome of the withdrawal process. Um, because it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy, as we've learned, for these meetings. And um, I don't know which way it would go with, right, with sure. the process with us, but it just seems reasonable to wait, uh, kind of a wait and see. Um, who knows how long this litigation right. that, is that's going to go. not an unreasonable position um, and I think you have to figure out where the line is in terms of you know where the where the whether the effort versus return uh, break even is uh, certainly you don't want to spend a lot of effort if it's not going to go anywhere if this is all if, if, if this is all just a pipe dream right um, on the other hand to spend a limited amount of effort to bring these to bring the issues into focus and you know maybe not by a whole group but by a working group or some limited number of people that has the time and the bandwidth to bring the issues into focus and understand how you just get a general sense of what might be entailed and what your concerns might be or anything like that might be worth your while i'm not going to suggest you do it one way or the other perfectly reasonable to say let's just stand down until uh the legal process uh um uh, you know unfolds further uh but uh from Fionn's perspective, uh, and we're kind of exactly, have been kind of exactly where you are, but we're gonna pick up the pace a little bit and see, okay, if this gets real in any case, we need to know what we're, what we're willing to accept, on what basis we're uh, willing to join another district or on what basis we're willing to remain within the SAD. And that'll get real for us you know, it, it'll, that'll get real to say on the same time frame, and we'll know whether we have any, any um, potential to negotiate either way mm -hmm. uh, very soon. Well, but it doesn't hurt to think about it in advance. No, no, I, yeah. it doesn't hurt to think about it. Just sometimes the train goes very slow. Well, that's what I'm concerned about because <laughs> yeah. the tra that, that's why I'm, I'm saying it wouldn't hurt to think now because there's going to come a time when the train's going to have to go fast. And, why? And, well, because uh, if if I'm, I'm making this up, no, I don't know I'm, this for I'm not sure. being belligerent. But I'm if the island on. is allowed to withdraw, uh, we are going to have to come up with uh, an educational plan. We're going to have to come up with a plan of a action to educate our children. I, I think the law gives us some time on that, but it's not indefinite. Mm -hmm. and Could you, you stand say, alone? Pardon? You talked about standing alone. Do you have to join a district, or can we you don't. stand alone? We don't. We don't. But our placeholder position is that. The best way to show good faith and to act conscientiously is to join a regional school district. We could stand alone. We could come up with an educational plan. I think. I don't know this for sure, and I don't want to make a rash statement, but um, if, if uh, we could come up with an educational plan that says, you know, if we ever get students, um, this is what we'll do. And in the meantime, we'll pay the statutory minimum amount to the state. Um, uh, there's a general feeling, I mean, I, I imagine that would be attractive to some people, but there's a general feeling on the island that, that that's uh, uh, probably uh, less than we ought to be doing, uh, uh, given that we, you know, that, that, that we, we, we live, we live in the, we live in the community, every, the, 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 the analogy is, and you, you I should tell you, I, I was on a, the school committee in town, I live when I'm not on Fry Island. Uh, for many years, um, several terms, five terms, I believe. And uh, so I'm a little bit familiar with the challenges of, of, of uh, operating a school system uh, within a budget. Um, and uh, we, uh, um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. What did you ask me? What I was asking stand about alone. standing alone. Oh, standing alone. Um, we, we, I, I, town has a conscience, and, and we're not sure that that's the best way. We thought about sort of uh, crazy schemes like, look, if, 
if we're going to give money to some district, uh, just basically make a donation, it was you know never or ordained in heaven that the, that those uh, four other towns should have the benefit of of that what amounts to a donation in perpetuity. <coughs> Why don't we uh, just make a donation to some uh, really indigent district in the north of Maine or something? So we've had some sort of out of the box thinking along those lines, but it's always been along the lines of how do we fulfill our moral obligation to support the educate to support education in a, in a in a in a state and a region of which we are uh, members and uh, the, the societal benefits of which we receive. We we have a lot of just a lot of general societal benefits that we receive from existing in in in, in this region in the state of Maine, and and that's acknowledged and and. There's no wish to shirk the responsibility to support education. So, but yeah, we've thought about it, um, and 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 that may be on the table. Uh, but right now, I was charged with opening a serious and purposeful dialogue with RSU 14, uh, with the objective of having a placeholder plan to join RSU 14 should we be allowed to. Uh, that was put into place shortly after we filed the. Uh, petition to withdraw, and that's when I first made contact with Sandy. The first meeting we could have at that time was December the 8th or whatever it was, and this is the first meeting we could have since then. So that's how the process unfolded. But uh, my charge was if, to see if we could uh, set, forward, set in motion a process that would um, uh, provide a framework for us to join RSU 14 if that became possible and, and necessary. Within the context, I, I keep stipulating that we, we are committed to negotiating good, in good faith with the district. That has not been possible in the, in, mm -hmm. in the, um, you know, the uh, 21 years since the secession. So I have to say, I, um, I was really surprised to learn that Fry Island was part of S86. Being a Raymond resident, to me, the common sense says geographically Fry Island is I mean, we can see it from <laughs> the end, you know, the end of the road. Um, we, once the open season, you know, it opens up, it's almost like one town. I mean, we're back and forth so openly. Um, and I, I don't see the negative in it. I mean, if years from now, I don't see even in the next <coughs> 10 years Fry Island becoming, you know, a year place with year-round residents where we're going to have students to support. But let's just say that happened. I mean, would we really look at the few children that might be out on Fry Island and be like, oh, no, you can't come to our schools, you know, good luck to you. That just doesn't seem like something that we would do. And again, geographically and with common sense, it's, you know, Fry Island, Fry Island is a community very similar to our own here in Raymond, very close to us. So to me, it, it makes sense. I, I don't. You know, not that we're anywhere near saying like, woo, -hoo, everybody go. No, of course but not. But just yeah. and yeah. I have to tell you that as much as I've said about, you know, gee, it's 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 proximal so that kids could go there, there is not a discernible path yeah. to, to Fry Island having uh, uh, you know, as, as long as as long as there's, you know, uh, ice on the lake and some of the other impediments to uh, uh, you know, and in a way it would change kind of the culture of the island a little bit too. Uh, because no longer a seasonal community, it's kind of mm. people would be kind of a, just another commuter community like anything else. Yeah. But so that would the, the likelihood is vanishingly small. But you, you have to consider that as part of the context. Mm. Any Excellent. Comments? All right. Yeah. So I'm not really sure where where we go from here. I think we need to talk about it as a board. Well, maybe you could maybe caucus a little bit, and then somebody future. we could keep the discussions alive just between whoever you might delegate and uh, whether it be Sandy, Diana, I don't want to suggest how you should, you should conduct yourselves, but um, um, if we could just manage to somehow keep the, keep the conversation alive. Um, I mean, I am very sensitive to not wasting anybody's time if it turns out that we can't do it. But on the other hand, there's lots of things that you'd like to have thought about when the time comes to have thought about them. So. Yeah. Is it possible for you, because you're putting together a committee, correct? Mm -hmm. it, yes. Have you met yet? No. No. Um, to lay the groundwork and you put together a template of things that you're looking for, 
and that would be a springboard for us. I suppose that would be possible. It, 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 the, it would certainly, and we could do that if that's if that's what it took to get the process moving forward. Um, I had always envisioned any kind of a discussion like this um, being a, a, a pretty collaborative working group based thing trying to trying to solve. I'm not it. suggesting oh. it wouldn't be, but it, yeah, sure. I mean, you got to um, start someplace. We'd be happy right, to do right. That. Yeah, Just sure. I what think. are the you don't know what you don't know. So what are the what are the talking points here sure, for this? Sure, we could we could put deal. together a, uh, some parameters. Say here's the kind of things we need to be thinking about. Right, here's right. the kind of open issues. Somebody suggested to me uh, through a back channel of some sort. I can't remember. It's been a long time ago now. That j j what if there were some uh, you know really um, for one one of a better word really uh, 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 needful and expensive special needs students. That emerged on file and down the road. Well, mm -hmm. okay, put that on the list. It's a thing we can develop uh, a, 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 plan. a mechanism to mm -hmm. deal with at the time. That's not an insurmountable thing. Uh, it, the likelihood of that materializing is again vanishingly small, but still, it's something to think about. So, the only reason I bring it up is you can put together a list of what ifs or what are the things we need to think about, what are the major considerations, um, and, and go from there. Yeah. Uh, and, and we would certainly, it's in our interest to do that anyway. We need to do it anyway. We're happy to do it. I think it. it would be helpful. Yeah. I mean, as a springboard for a discussion, collaboratively. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean <laughs> no, to. No, no, no. I'm, I'm I, with I you. I don't mean that. to sound preaching. No, I'm that. with I apologize. you. Yeah. yeah. Um, from that, it would have to probably go because that would bring up a lot of questions and there'd be nobody there to answer them. If I think it's a nice we start. We work together, so if we could probably get put together our list of, okay, this is from this, okay, these are our questions back from whatever, and then we have it's to It's a decide. process. We'll figure right. it out. I'm sorry, Marge, I didn't hear that. I apologize. No, that, it's, a good, it's a good start, but the thing being is once we do that and we have your list and we start talking about it and we have questions, we would have to return the favor, so to speak, and we'd have to have put our questions together and say, okay, right. these are the things that we come up with that we need answers to or need to know what, or somehow. That's when we go meet. From there. That's when we meet. Yeah. Right. right, right. Again, at the time we started the conversation, um, uh, I, I had to s assume that the withdrawal process would be allowed to go forward because there wasn't any reason at that point to assume that it wouldn't. Um, I can't say the district's filing a uh, filing a, a, a suit against us. It was a surprise, but it, it was something that you expect but hope doesn't happen. And uh, so, uh, we have not, uh, uh, you know, we don't we don't really, as I said, have a well developed pros. We need to do it too. So, if, if the best thing that could come out of this is if there's a point person um, that uh, I'd be it for now, and uh, and that could get some take homes and as people think about it. Uh, we can we can put together some notions as to what we would be willing to do, but you don't get very far down that path before you want to say to somebody else, uh, "What do you think of this?" Right. So um, we get there pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure how this would affect what's going on with the litigation and everything else. But is your thought that it's better for you if you're able to go forward, if you go, can go back and say, we have, so, we have some work in process. Are you looking for that to be a piece of it? It's kind of like, we have a plan. If you let us go forward with this, we have a plan. I don't think that, certainly that would be desirable. I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's a driver for us because okay. uh, we get some time, so if I understand it correctly, to develop the plan. Uh, it, you know, time goes by a lot quicker than you think it does, would, but we get some time. What what would be desirable is if, which I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask the district to put itself in that position, this district. But uh, what would be desirable, uh, from our perspective, is to say, is, is to say, you know, look, there are other stakeholders involved in this. It's not just Fry Island. Um, it's not just Fry Island trying to get a, get out of the SAD, and um, and. Uh, leave the SAD in a difficult situation. First of all, we're not trying to do that. Um, but secondly, uh, it, it's not just the, the you know, small number of people on Fry Island that don't comprise a constituency for anybody that would be affected. Now there's a, another couple of communities that have a stake in this as well. Uh, that would be first prize, but you know, it's too early for that to happen. 
So okay. to so to go forward, since we just all some of us received the information tonight, um, do you want to discuss at a future meeting? Would it be because I don't want to put anybody on the spot to. I honestly ask don't you. feel very comfortable moving forward until litigation's wrapped up. Unless you guys consult with the attorneys and find out. I wonder I, if we could. I don't know um, if I have a problem. Might I? Yeah, so please. <laughs> just thinking please that, do. Um, I think the notion of point people makes sense, and I, I do think that waiting to see what's going to happen with the litigation certainly is going to be um, the uh, threshold at which point you might want to have more discussion. So I would just yeah. suggest that school board leadership meet, discuss this a little bit, and figure out how we're going to stay in touch mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, get that listing of uh, parameters or whatever uh, it's referred to as and go from there. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Thank Given you. the fact that there's not a whole lot we can do right now, I really appreciate okay. all this time. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay, next on the agenda, we have um, an update from the Homework Committee, and Kim McBride, the Assistant Principal of Wyndham Middle School, is here to discuss, hopefully, recommendations from your committee. Thank you. Good evening. So, hi everyone. Hi. Um, Good evening. Kim McBride, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. From the middle school, I'm the assistant principal at the middle school. And I've been working for the last couple of years on the homework policy um, with the assistance of a homework committee. That came out of goal two a couple of years ago during that strategic planning process. Goal two is the environment for learning. And at that time, it felt like homework had become onerous for a lot of students, that it had really impacted the, um, the well-being of students and students and their families as well. And so the strategic plan committee at that time formed a homework committee to take a look at where we are <clears throat> as a district, where we should be, to take a look at the most current research around homework and the extent to which it's supportive of learning and the extent to which it can be, in fact, detrimental. And so I came before you at the end of June last year, 2017, mm -hmm. and provided you with some of our early findings and thinking. And we've had an opportunity, as you requested, to conduct a little bit more research. And we've come up with what we're calling homework policy recommendations. This is not a homework policy, but it wouldn't be, it's not a far stretch to make it one if you wish to. So <clears throat> you can read this, but I know you're getting it for the first time. Some of the language <coughs> will sound familiar to uh, the language that you heard in June. So let's go through this really quickly. So it begins, this paper begins by acknowledging that homework has long been an important part of the American school experience, for better or for worse. It is something that uh, parents often interpret as uh, evidence of learning. It also has been something that parents find stressful and can cause conflict, although, as we'll talk about in a moment, that seems to be less true in our issue 14 based on our research than we might have otherwise thought. It is a... a um, a way to extend the school day without additional expense. It's a way to teach. We've always believed that <clears throat> it's a way to teach non-academic skills that we value, like perseverance and stick to and diligence. And there's no research that really supports that it does. In fact, the research seems to say that uh, requiring children to do something they don't want to do doesn't make them want to do it. So <laughs> there is that, um, which would probably be true that. for all of us, right? <laughs> right? The research about homework is surprisingly inconclusive and and somewhat um, contradictory. Um, the value of homework varies a lot with the age of the student, the purpose of the assignment, and, and the goals. So we have surveyed <clears throat> students from grades 6 through 12, and we also surveyed a representative sample of parents from grades K through 12, and looked at the most current research. And so based on all of that work, uh, here are some guidelines for your consideration. <clears throat> First of all, homework should always be in our opinion, relevant, challenging, meaningful, and purposeful. And it should always be closely connected to classroom objectives. It should buy, provide students with the opportunity to apply and extend the information that they've learned, complete unfinished class projects, and also to develop independence and uh, solidify 
skills that are learned in the classroom. Effective homework is going to be a clear extension of learning targets, encouraging students at its best to apply what they've learned in new and interesting ways. It should be differentiated to meet the needs of students. Not all students need the same homework every time. Students should be involved in its design whenever possible. Unfortunately, and this is always the question that I think is critical and central when we thought, think about this, is how much is enough? How much homework is too much? How much is not enough? Is it OK to not have any homework? And it turns out that there's no reliable formula to determine the best amount of homework. Simply saying 10 minutes per grade level, which is something that was used, it really has no basis in research at all. I think its appeal is that it's simple and clear. We can just do the math, right, and figure out that if you're in third grade, then maybe half an hour of homework is fine. Fourth grade, it goes to 40. And that's really been uh, kind of an arbitrary um, benchmark, actually. And then we know that the amount of time that is required for students to do homework is going to depend a lot on their age and their situation and their ability and their commitment and so forth. So here are the pieces that I think we could think of as specific recommendations if you choose to take them as such. So in grades K through 5, there is a lot of research that supports the expectation that students read nightly, typically for 20 minutes, more or less. Homework might also reasonably include some math facts. Other types of homework are not really so closely associated with higher achievement in grades K through 5. But reading is really clear that across the board, K through 12 and into adulthood, of course, uh, that reading every night has benefits that are shown in comp levels of comprehension, vocabulary, and so forth. Um, grades 6 through 8, things change a little bit. We could expect students to continue to read nightly to study for assessments and finish work not completed during class. And they might also be expected to complete activities at home that are logical extensions of classwork. For example, interviewing a family member about a historical event that is being studied, family member or an elderly neighbor, you know, um, would be a logical extension and enrichment to the content that was being learned in the classroom. In grades 9 through 12, we'd be looking at reasonably all of the tasks that are suggested for grades 6 through 8, although the complexity and the rigor of those tasks is going to change and the going to increase. And similarly, the um, homework load is going to be heavier, more rigorous in honors and AP classes. And the big change there is that with those classes, we do expect students to be learning independently. So getting the bio textbook, for example, reading the chapter and being tested on it, as Jen is very fond of doing, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and so learning independently is going to be more expected um, in grades 9 through 12, especially in the honors and AP classes. One of the interesting things that we have learned really through this research and as we've looked at um, how parents in RSU 14 responded, um, parents felt strongly, our parents felt strongly that homework should be checked by teachers and that students should receive some specific feedback on homework and that it should not just get a check. Um, we, we've changed, as you know, in our U14, for the most part, the way that we report homework, which is now considered to be an important indicator of uh, students' habits of work. And that needs to continue. But parents really do want, if your student is doing homework, they really do want the student to get some kind of acknowledgement or credit for that. And we need to help parents understand that the amount of homework doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. equate with levels of learning or course rigor, that it's very possible to learn at a high level without bringing a lot of it home. We also recognize that the way we teach now with standards-based really depends quite heavily on classroom projects, collaborative activities, <coughs> Socratic seminars, uh, activities like that that don't necessarily translate easily into homework in the traditional sense. Um, we have at the end a note that students from, from some households are going to find it difficult, may find it difficult to complete homework due to competing commitments, family responsibilities, and limited access to technology and learning space. And the teachers need to be sensitive to grading policies so that those students aren't further disadvantaged. But our research shows that um, nearly over 80% of our parents say my student needs access to technology but has it. And, um, Almost all parents reported that my student does have a, a quiet place to do homework. So the support for the family resources, at least among the respondents, certainly seems to be there to support. Uh, one thing that doesn't really appear on this, but it's important to, I think, keep in mind is that, as I alluded to earlier, this subject was put into the environment for learning section of the strategic plan because it did seem to directly impact on the 
emotional and mental well-being of students, uh, who at that time, at least the group that was present during that discussion that night, which I remember well, although it was a while ago now, um, were really clear that it had, can become, the burden can become just that burdensome, that it can really become crushing. But when we surveyed students, we found that um, <clears throat> many of our students, most of our students said that they often can finish their homework in class or right after school. 47% say they finish their assignments on time most of the time, and 31% say that they always finish their assignments on time. Self-reported, we understand, but that 78% of students who are saying they complete their assignments all the time, on time, or most of the time, on time. Only 12% of students say that they experience significant stress in RSU 14 due to homework. 12% say they experience significant stress, which feels like a, 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 to me, that felt a little bit low. I was a little bit surprised to hear that. 7% say they experience no stress. So those are the kids who are really zen about the whole thing, I guess. So that's really 20% of our students say they experience no or little stress. And then very few students said they experienced high stress and everybody else was sort of distributed along the middle. Um, over 60% of the students surveyed claimed that homework causes stress in their families only sometimes and only rarely. So to say that another way, over half of our students say it is not a stressor in their family. And 16% say that it never causes stress. Those are the same kids who are like, yeah, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm good. I don't have any stress about it. So that 76% of students who, say, who are saying that this is not a stressful thing for my family to have to deal with. And 60% say that they can complete their homework independently most of the time. So they're suggesting that they're not needing a lot of help and that it's not creating a significant amount of conflict or stress. Again, these are self-reported observations, so you know they're what they are. But it's pretty clear that, um, that they're handling it. Um, when we surveyed parents, um, they said that 26% of them said homework never causes stress and 36% say that it causes some but not a lot. So that's just over half of parents saying not much <coughs> stress really, uh, which is not really inconsistent with what students said. 86% um, of the respondents say that homework in my family only sometimes or rarely causes homework, uh, causes stress. So again, not a really high amount of, of parents, not a really high percentage of parents identifying homework as a significant stressor. 63% uh, say they rarely have to help their child, which is very consistent with the 60% of students who said they can do it independently and their parents are backing them up and saying, yeah, we don't have to help. But 73% of our parents say they're checking regularly with their child to see if they have homework. So, um, and again, nearly everyone acknowledged, yes, they need technology, yes, we have it, we have in reliable internet access and students have a place to work. And I'm, I'm suspecting, although this is only my guess because we didn't answer, ask the question quite this way, but I'm guessing that um, the fact that our students, at least in grades six through 12, all have a one-on-one -on -one device has made homework less stressful and there's less competition for the family computer because they have their own. Yeah. So that's where we are with the survey and that's where we are the, with the policy recommendations that come out of that. Your administrative team has not had an opportunity to look at these. I can speak on behalf of Mr. Patton at the middle school and me and say that uh, we both feel strongly that some sort of policy guidelines that look something like this might be helpful and then they can certainly be articulated at the different grade levels in a way that makes sense. So I'm happy to answer questions, Marge. Um, in all your percent numbers, do you have the percent of how many parents answered the questions versus how many parents there are in the same with the students? You're saying 67%. It's not of the whole <coughs> no, no. population. So we did a representative. What is that percent? So we did a representative sample of parents. So all of the student, we had 250 students respond, okay, out of a possible, well, we have about, um, what do we have at the middle school? We have about 600 and another 900. So 1,500 students and we had about 250 of them respond. So I don't know what percentage that is, but. And so the percentages are the percentages of respondents. For parents, we took a representative sample from K, from um, RES, JSMS, and the other schools, uh, primary, Manchester, middle school, and high school. So it's a representative sample, and the percentages are just of that sample, um, not of everybody. Does that answer your question? It does, because it's probably, it's similar. It always reminds me of um, 
parent-teacher. And it's kind of like in the teacher saying, well, I always know who's going to show up because those are the good students and <laughs> those are the parents I always get to see, which is great, right. which is good. <laughs> so to me, it, I, I think that is slightly skewed because I think people who are having problems, right. they're not going to respond. Right. And that's why and if this students. were truly a scientific poll, there would be a margin right. of error because it's yeah. certainly it's self-reported and self-selected in a way because you weren't required to fill out the survey. So parents who are parents and students who are completely disengaged maybe didn't even bother to respond. Yeah. And the other thing too is because we have our our breakfast at the high school lunch or whatever we call Combo. it now. Brunch. <laughs> brunch. We'll call it brunch. <laughs> And, and a vast ma in a lot of the students that we have there are some of the AP and the honors and whatever. And I'd say the percent of students that come that say they're having stress is much higher than the percent of mm -hmm. what you than what just reported yeah. of the ones mm -hmm. that sit in front of us. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them feel, some of the feel is that, you know, it's busy work and I really can't afford busy work because I really have enough real work I have to do. And the other thing was, and it's funny because you mentioned it, I turn it in, and if, you know, if I don't, the teacher never looks at it, mm -hmm. you know, so. Mm -hmm. Right. And parents feel very so strongly tough, that yeah. students need some credit and some feedback yeah. If, they're, yeah. if they're going to do it's that. It's important. Homework. I mean, it's some of them. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's <laughs> a lot of effort. Me. <laughs> Jesus, me. Yeah, and I'd like to comment just, like, as a student who does a lot of homework, um, and how I've kind of seen with the how grade, which you lately touched upon, um, with how I feel like grades might be potentially dropping because homework technically isn't required in a lot of my classes. It's different with like projects, you know, you have this essay due or something like that or a bigger project that okay, you know, put an hour every night for the next week and have it done. That's a little bit different, but with like math, I'm in an AP statistics class and during class is an instructional period um, and then homework is sent home, but it's not collected and we do go over it, but that means that the answers are given to you. So why do it? And so I, that's one of the things that I kind of struggle with because I do a lot of tutoring in that class mm -hmm. to kids who don't do the homework because it's, I mean, it's put in their how grade if the teacher checks that you did it. Um, but it's completely the practice. You know, on the test, when you go down to, when you go to take the test, it's not going to be on like the instructional. It's going to be the equations and how you actually do the math. Um, so I think that might be something, or that's one of my concerns, just because if you don't do the homework, you don't do the practice for the actual test. And so that is something that I've seen um, a lot in some of my classes. So I I'd bring that up. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, well said, Jen. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for this information. It's always um, great to get the data. Um, and you did a nice job of correlating mm. the student and the parent mm -hmm. that made sense, at least to me. Um, and it was really interesting because it wasn't necessarily what I expected. N nor was it what I would have expected yeah. either. Um, of course, I have my policy hat on. And when I hear that um, policy recommendations, I, when I left the last time, I got the sense that um, it wasn't recommended to have policy. So what changed? So I don't think anything changed. Um, I did hear sort of, I, I had the impression from talking with um, administrators that the board might be interested in policy recommendations. That may not be true. Yeah. And I think you, we could also adopt guidelines. We could adopt regulations. We could adopt a policy. We could adopt nothing. And this document or version of it mm -hmm. could be shared with administrators to be interpreted by faculty at each school site so that <clears throat> I think what would be helpful about that would be that RSU 14 would have a set of common guidelines that could then be interpreted within each school setting because mm -hmm. the whole homework issue, as is true with many issues, is very different in the early grades and the upper grades. And in the right. upper grades, it's very different <coughs> from standard academic honors to AP classes. So it's hard to have a, a single set of really prescriptive guidelines. Mm -hmm. But the intent with this is that it would be general enough so that 
a, a new staff member, for example, at the middle school, wondering what is the deal with homework, like what's our culture around homework and what's it, what is the community expectation, could be given this or something like it, and mm -hmm. then could use that as a sort of guideline along with conversations with team members. Does that make sense? It does. Um, it seems like it's a bifurcated, I love that word, <laughs> um, thing in that it's a message for teachers, mm -hmm. and then it's a communication for students and right. parents. Right. Um, and as I'm listening to you and thinking about policy, um, it almost, and again, of course, I'm at the beck and call of this crowd as far as creating a policy, and if that's the decision of the board, we will certainly move forward with that. But based on what you've told me, it almost feels like guidelines, mm -hmm. um, yeah. administrative yeah. rules by building right. um, that's pertinent to your age group rather than just a policy that it almost feels like rubber stamping and right. does it get enforced and we don't know. And it no, I think that's right, Kate. I think that makes sense. And I think one of the things a document like this would do is to disabuse us of a couple misconceptions about homework. One is the 10 minute per grade rule. Right. And, mm. and the other is the, my child, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard this, I don't know what they're learning because they never bring homework home. Yeah. And, you know, and, and so I think helping everyone understand that homework does not necessarily equate to um, learning. And also that the idea, and, and this is kind of, I don't know, I think this is sort of central too. The expression in our culture, he does his homework, right? Means that you are prepared, that you do your work, that you're a reliable person, right? And that you're always prepared for everything. There's a sort of a, like a value placed on, on that. Um, and so the idea of homework in school, that it builds character somehow, that, that it builds uh, resilience and grit and persistence. Mm. Uh, there are, those are all important qualities, but there are other ways to do that besides just homework. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, and there's really no research. And people have looked at that. You know, I think I talked in June about the they'd better get used to it kind of mentality that is out there. And there's really very little research that supports that. So. Right. I mean, it feels like it, it dovetails. And obviously, it does with, I like your anachronism, how. I haven't ever used that before, <laughs> um, habits of work. Right. Um, and I. I just to reiterate, I just, since the administrative team hasn't seen it either, I think that would be a discussion maybe, Sandy, for you and that crowd to kind of flesh out if you want a district-wide or if you just want it building pertinent to that, that would be the administrative's, yeah. if, if everybody I else. Yeah, yeah, I agree too. Uh, another general policy. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I definitely like the idea of having like district-wide sort of guidelines and culture around it because yeah. um, I, for a long time, was probably just as guilty as, you know, I'm not seeing anything coming home, um, but my kids are quick to put me in place, so <laughs> I don't get to think that way for too long. Um, but just if we, if we had something that we're all on board with, with and, you know, as a district, we are all on the same page, um, it can really, I think, help kind of support that overarching goal of just because you don't see a packet of math facts that you have to go over every single night doesn't mean they're not learning and not doing stuff. Right. I meant to look through, all, and I didn't have a chance to do it, all the um, different schools' handbooks to see if they had a homework mm -hmm. blurb in there. And that almost feels like an appropriate place by building. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And then it could be pointed out to the student, well, it's in your handbook, and this is the deal. Right. And gives right. it a little bit of teeth, anyway. And this is how it's yeah. graded. And I, right. think, I do think we've made great progress in our issue 14 in grading homework. I think we're pretty consistent. And it's a big change mm -hmm. in putting it in habits of work instead of averaging it into the grade. Well, thank you for this. Yeah. And no, I think this is great. And I agree that this should be guidelines rather than policy. Um, one thing that I would like to see as part of the discussions uh, among the administrators um, when they're discussing this and the, the teachers themselves is that the timing of homework, because that's one of the things that we heard when I went to the breakfast with the uh, students at the high school mm -hmm. is that oftentimes all the projects or all the tests would all happen at the same time. Right. And if, if you have one, t if you're in a, an environment at the lower grades where you have one teacher, the teacher's not gonna give you a math test and an English test and a social studies test on the same day. So if there can be some communication amongst the teachers. 
yeah, just that's, to try to smooth that out a little bit more. It's really important, and I didn't mention as we kind of did the overview of this, if you look in the last paragraph on the first page under amount of homework, teachers using collaborative tools to coordinate their assignments with other teachers, and with Google Classroom and all the other tools we have at our disposal, it will be fairly easy to do that, to avoid that, because that's a real burden on students, and it's easily avoided mm -hmm. if yeah. we just talk. Yeah. yeah. Or, or use, use the technology available to coordinate that. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can check that off your list. <laughs> Next, I know. <laughs> if you take that off, something else is coming on, right? Too much. <laughs> Next, we have Phil Rossetti, the assistant principal at Wyndham High School, who is presenting an update on the late start committee. Good evening. So to kind of echo Kim, this uh, school start time committee work kind of came out from the uh, strategic plan, long-term goal number two, environment for learning. So we've been tasked with doing a lot of work on what, what's a preferred start time for our district, are we able to make any changes, um, kind of more data collection than anything for our group. So you're not going to get necessarily a recommendation, but will you, you will get um, kind of an, an end statement at the end of this document. So, so An end statement. We'll go with that. How's okay. that? <laughs> like it's done? So, Just a horse of another uh, color, right? Just, Just we'll get to that, Mars, right? So, uh, so for us, uh, you know, the process was involved us really taking a look at kind of every building in the district, every school. We also looked at, um, you know, what an impact would be with the work and scenarios I've mentioned here before was uh, 30 minutes. We kind of used that as a working uh, time frame for us to kind of work through the process. Knowing that really ultimately, you know, um, for adolescents, you're looking at an 8.30 um, start time is kind of the most preferred uh, based on all the research out there. Um, allows kids and adolescents to get a good, good night's sleep. Most kids, they start to fall asleep 9 o'clock or later um, is when they, the uh, melatonin starts to kick in in their body and they start to get sleepy. So that's kind of the big piece around the science. So for us, uh, we looked at every little area to kind of see what would an impact be in each building. We also looked at transportation. We also looked at facilities to, to, to as well gain kind of an idea of what an impact might be there. So all the information, all the documents are on the um, strategic website, uh, strategic planning website. So all the minutes, everything's located there for people who want to go at home who may be watching this and want to go do some more work um, to understand it. So our goal uh, was to kind of, as I said, to look at why consider a change or not, what are the challenges around and considerations around making a change, um, what's the community think about this change, and then kind of come back to is there a recommendation to kind of share from our group um, ultimately with the A team, uh, the administrative team, then to come forward to you folks. Um, we did a lot of work. We've administered a lot of surveys um, for students, uh, grades 6 to 12. We opened up one for all the district staff as well. Um, we've reached out to area schools who've gone through the change to kind of collect information and data from them as well. Um, some have really great detailed information. Some it's all it's anecdotal information. Um, we've also surveyed parents. Um, we looked at a, a number of different scenarios. We talked about maybe is flipping a schedule around, is that a, something to look at as well? Flipping elementary and high, and high school, middle school start times. Um, and ultimately, you know, we found a lot of hurdles in the process to going to make any change in our district. So on, for us on the second page, and this is all information, some of it's stuff I've already shared with the board in previous briefings um, with you folks. So. For us, some of the hurdles we ran into is around transportation, um, athletics, elementary school times um, as well, because if we didn't flip and we moved times, we'd, they'd get out of school later. So there's a lot of concern about drop-offs late at night or late afternoons, 4 o'clock or later. Um, so there was some concerns around that. Um, the research around f uh, flipping start times is kind of limited and inconsistent. There's not a lot of great research around the effects of that. Um, and same, so yeah, so with flipping. Um, so I'm going to kind of skip ahead. I've talked a lot in the past around the staff um, surveys, the student surveys, and I'm going to kind of focus on the parent surveys. That's new information for the board. 
and that's on the it's really kind of essentially the third and into the last page so we were fortunate enough in our survey we kind of publicized it and got it out there really well at the start of school so in early august um, as we kind of came back to school until early october we had the survey kind of set out to a bunch of different in a bunch of different formats um sandy had sent it out in the well in the link um we sent it out every school had sent it out to uh, parents on their welcome back information so we kind of got it out there um so we had a we had 984 respondents which i was kind of pleased to see um of that you know we had 883 that actually had a student that attended rsu 14 schools 100 that did not so we set the survey <coughs> to um re reflect that so certain questions that they wouldn't answer if they didn't have students in school um so for us in looking at and kind of going through that last page um wake up times for students you know most of the 35 percent of the parents indicated their students wake up before 6 a.m to get ready for school 44 percent said between 6 6 30 so if you're really looking at our district 79 percent of the students get up before 6 30 to get ready for school that's a, certainly a challenge um 81 percent of our kids need to be woken up by an alarm or somebody else or some someone else um so that kind of indicates you know that they're not quite ready to to wake up as well um we have 60 percent of our students in our district ride the school bus so we have a large number of uh, students that ride the school bus we have a big district as well geographically compared to a lot of communities who've made this change and i can share some information on that in a little bit um on average uh, most 47 you know, of parents indicated their their kids go to bed between 8 and 9 p.m so it's probably uh, probably more geared towards elementary parents who've responded there mm -hmm. i know i have a daughter that's hopefully in bed right now and it's and she's in first grade so <laughs> and she goes to bed 7 30 ish um 42 percent of the families indicated after nine o'clock so we talked about you know impact if we did make a change we threw a scenario at the parents as well and that looked at 60 uh, percent of them said that um, there would be it would be easier have no significant impact if we moved start time 30 minutes later uh 35 percent or 36 percent indicated it'd be slightly more challenging if we move the time around uh, at the end of the day impact on parents 53 percent indicated it would make it easier have no impact uh, 42 percent said it would make it slightly more challenging so the afternoon we kind of see is more of a challenge for parents um, daycare work siblings um, all those things could be factors um, and we kind of skip to the last question you know we put it out there are you in favor of adjusting our school start time by 30 minutes well 49 percent of the people said yes they would be and 33 percent said no 18 percent need more information so we're kind of at a 50 50 split really when it comes to the district uh, in terms of parents so with all that in mind we brought this information to um, the administrative team of the district and we we looked at it and um, processed what it, we could do ultimately the impact is it's it's a challenge for us um, because uh, transportation is a huge challenge for us to move modify manipulate um, we have a, a large district um, compared to uh, we think we're 95 square miles compared to some of the other districts who've made this change when you think about a uh, a town like south portland that's 24 square miles um yarmouth 20 square miles you know so some different communities that have made this change but they're single town communities so they don't have to bus great distances so that's a real challenge for us um having two communities schools kind of scattered throughout the district um as well so for us the recommendation at this time from the administration te administrative team uh, is that school start time remains status quo uh, what we've done is we've reviewed the logistics around busing is there a way to manipulate that at all shave five minutes here ten minutes there type of a situation we sat down with mike kelly went through that i mean his transportation is to the minute um, efficient so there really is no wiggle room unfortunately in that system um so kind of out of this you know the remain status quo was kind of the recommendation that came out of the a team um and then kind of archive the work kind of keep it on hand and reflect on it if some things change so questions yes Mark. um is there any way that we can track how it's working i i know you say it's different other mm -hmm. places but that we can Absolutely. track how it's working for them you know what i mean so we'll yeah. have some idea it's like okay they've been doing it for a year they've been doing yeah. it for two years 
and it's worked out <coughs> well for them. I think that also, even though I know they're structured a little different than sure. us. Sure. And, you know, so that would be not the transportation, but, yeah. you know, are they seeing improvement? Absolutely, yeah. They're yeah. later, so yeah. are their students doing better? Are their grades getting better? Or are they, are they more sure. awake? I don't know. Yeah, exactly. No, I and I think moving done. forward, that's just definitely an open line of communications, you know, districts share information quite well. And, and I've reached out to so many people. We stay in touch when I see them at different conferences or meetings or whatnot. We uh, definitely sh share that. So it's something we definitely keep in mind and keep a, keep a look at as we move forward. Okay. Um, what kind of effect would that have on the vocational school? That's a good question. Um, right now, keeping things the way it is, there's, there's really no impact. Um, if we move to an 8 o'clock start with high school, they'd show up to vocational school late. Yeah. Okay. So vocational schools have been flexible with that because they have so many different sending schools and so many mm -hmm. different start times for schools. So there's some flexibility. Um, it's going to be a challenge with some of the area schools, I think, as we move forward. I know um, some of those vocational schools are look also reflecting and looking at their start times as well. So, mm. yeah. I, that, that question came up at one of, because I'm on the advisory committee when we were at the meetings and that it did come up. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of keeping an eye on it because some of the districts <coughs> are changing their times. So they go, they're <coughs> looking to see mm -hmm. how, they don't see it as an issue right, right now. Yeah. but. We can wait and see. Yeah. I hate when I when I disagree with you guys because I love all the work that you guys do. And I don't it take really, it personally. It don't really, worry. I do. I take it personally. When, but I I I don't like the like let's wait and see. Um, I think there's a lot. You guys have done so much work and there's so much shown so much. How much potential is there for it to be a positive mm -hmm. impact? Um, and I'm personally have lived I have a daughter that's out of district at a, a school that um, moved their late start time or their state start time back and it's it's 30 minutes and you think like that's ridiculous how could 30 minutes be that impactful but it really is wildly impactful um, I mean even looking at the numbers here when I look at it in our house we're one of those houses where everybody's up before 630 um, from my second grader all the way up to my senior everybody's up before 630 um, so even if you put that back a little bit, that means that we can keep bedtime at nine o'clock and people actually get enough sleep. Like it's, it's such a little change. Um, and you know, we talk about it in our house a lot cause I don't know if you notice I'm a little chatty. Um, so it's something that comes up in our house and, and even in our own house, the views have changed from, oh no, that's gonna be terrible. And you know, we have to work and there's extracurriculars and sports and mm -hmm. to, well, you know, we've seen other people do it. It's not really bad. And um, so I'm a little uncomfortable with let's just stay with the status quo. That's just my two cents on it. See, and I'm total opposite of the spectrum. <laughs> I am very happy with just kind of remaining status quo because I'm sitting back and I'm watching what's happening in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. And I kind of want to see how that whole thing plays out. Yeah. Yeah. I think the key here is we've done some really good research. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's not the recommendation right now to move forward, but down the road, if we learn more, if we can really get our handle on transportation, that's a huge barrier. Um, right. Just the amount of buses and more staff and the population of both towns, that Mike really struggled with trying to work through some of those issues. So. I'm very comfortable thinking that this is good work. Right now it doesn't make sense. Will it make sense five years from now? Maybe. And we'll have more research behind other districts as well. Um, but I think it's good that we studied it and, and yeah. um, we learned a lot. And at the same time, it could come back to us at some point in time. And to that end, we need to know what makes it you know why is it successful why is it successful right. exactly right like, i need some data that it is enhances it, student yeah. achievement right yeah. it can't just be oh well the kids seem more alert or the kids seem happier whatever i mean we need to know that grades are improving or i mean even attendance or mm -hmm. you know cut down on tardiness i mean there's going to be some tangible and, the, and that data is starting to be pulled together by area districts more and more. Some that are now two, maybe three years in this process are really starting to call that That'll data together. So it's really great. I know yeah. Yarmouth last year was the first year. They, they're they in their second year of a, of a later start. They had some great data, but it was one year's worth of data, some stuff that I shared with uh, you folks earlier uh, in the process. So Good. 
more info to come. Keep at it. So based on on information from surrounding districts, I hate to have this on hold and then it just kind of goes away. Goes away. Mm -hmm. I mean, can we have an update perhaps in a year's time? Is it reasonable to have more information from other districts or should we just kind of simmer it a little bit? I think it's hard because we, you can take all that information, but I'm, I'm not sure that we have some, as Sandy said, some hurdles we have to figure out within our the district. Transportation first. is a huge piece. It's, it's no a big doubt. one, and like I said, I mean, just geographically speaking, we're probably one of the biggest districts right. that are really looking at this and taking it in. Some of the area okay. districts that are have you know three or four different communities that send to their school high schools or whatnot, um, they're kind of in 730-ish still, so, so it's a challenge. Yeah. Um, can can we? not take a vote on it but can we do a general consensus only so it ends up in the minutes because the board changes or doesn't and then a year from now it'll be like what did we decide we were going to do about that just so it's in the minutes other than it'll just say yeah he was there and he talked about it, and it'll be like well, well what happened <laughs> right but then are it's we asking the agenda. committee to stay together Oh, no, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about us. No, I know, but if we want more information so on the road, would we, have, agree. would we have a different committee formed? Are you asking them to stay together? Oh, I'm not. Or you just want us to revisit? No, I just want us. No, I'm just talking about us. So I just guess in case we revisit it. You never know. You know, it'll kind of be like, well, whatever happened with, whatever happened on that? It's kind of like, because if you pull our minutes, our minutes will say that, you know, yes, Phil reported on it, but it'll never be, it won't have in it what, the so in other words, consensus, there was consensus, consensus of the board. board. Yes. Yeah. Hmm? Can't this be attached to the minutes? It's a recommendation on it. But that's his recommendation. That's not our our right. That we're agreeing. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm asking for, because it's happened, and I know it isn't just my age, but there'll come a time, and I always go back and it's like, now what did we do about that? <laughs> Four day a week, or, or you know, pay to play, or whatever, and it's kind of like, hey, do you still have all your data? <laughs> so, if we could just do like, you know, or even, even as you said, Pete, to a, oh, that's his recommendation, though. But. but I mean, the committee was charged with doing the research and presenting a recommendation, but I don't think that we ever said that we would act on the recommendation at the time. I mean, I think from that we could decide that we wanted to move something to a vote. I'm not sure how the process exactly works, but I think the committee Because I don't think we need to vote charge. on it. I think we just have mm -hmm. to come to a consensus that we agree with their recommendation for now. All right, I agree with or their something. recommendation. So you know what you I mean? So it goes in. So officially in the minutes. Right, I want it officially in the minutes. So if we ever go back, I know this sounds silly, but this is, believe me, this is <laughs> what got, happens. It's <laughs> like, what did we do, do about that? Do what you that? feel is right, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to amend the agenda then. Yeah, non-vote. Because we've done the it's head nod. Exactly it's not exactly asking for a vote, though. No, it's not, not a vote. No, I don't want to vote on it. No, good job. <laughs> I, want to I, just to I just wanted to show in I just wanted to show in the minutes. You know. Informally agreed. Yes, that we inform you, if we did. If you if, do. Once we, you know, do like a head nod or <laughs> majority or sentiment. So do you agree Minus with that his recommend? <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Do we have consensus then that we agree no, with the we'll recommendations? But we have majority. <laughs> Thank you. Well, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, Anna. I know how it feels to be in minority. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So yes. Yeah. I'm mean, a yes. Yeah. So yes, somehow so in the minutes, let it be stated, known. Thanks, Phil. Awesome. Thank you for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a good point, though. I know what you mean. It happens. <laughs> I forget. Okay. San, may I ask a question um, of Sam about the strategic plan? And this was goal two, I believe. Because um, I can't remember. Long term goal number two environment for learning, which is stated previously. Um, and and homework practices and time structures, which we've addressed. But the first one is school environment. RSU 14 will build an existing strengths and enhance current school environment 
to create optimum conditions for learning, and I can't remember how that is being addressed. Sure. <laughs> That's a lot of the proficiency work that we've been doing throughout the district. Um, actually, no. Well, That's goal one. But some of it is, but mostly it's looking at the existing safety structures we have in place um, that we're looking at. We That one we haven't even really begun to dig into because of we had school start going and we had homework going. Yeah, and then, no, I get it. I, I just right, don't Right, the know proficiency what that time. A lot of that came to, we're doing some really good ki things with our kids and kids have said we feel safe at school. We wanted to make sure that we always check up to make sure our kids feel safe in our schools especially with the enlightened things that have been happening in our world, and that we continue to revisit that. We actually have a meeting next week um, as you know, safety leaders to revisit and make sure everything is in place, God forbid anything happen, or taking the pulse of our students. Um, that has a lot to do with how our kids feel in their, our schools. Um, so we haven't done any more digging in that besides the safety piece um, with that part. So that goal will be coming well, I think Next. it's one of those goals that I think, if you remember when we craft, they, that was crafted, is we always want to keep a pulse on these things. Like, there are things that come up, there are trends in education that kind of rear its head, and, you know, unfortunately, safety is a huge one right now. And are our students feeling like they have adults to talk to? Do they, are they feeling like they feel safe in their environment? I mean, each of our buildings have, have gone under huge changes, you know, structurally in the last, since I've been here, and I've been here six years, but it's very different to get in our buildings as opposed to some other one. So a lot of work has been doing on that structure to make sure our kids, you know, are safe and feel safe when they're in our buildings and adults as well. So I did think though that the that late start committee was part of that goal. Yep, like, that was part of okay. that goal. Yep, yeah, but that's there, what Kate's I talking about there was late start, there was homework and there's then there's three bullets. There's was, three bullets the there. The there's bullet. another bullet, oh, Diana. Yeah. Again? The three bullets um, School environment, RSU 14, will build on existing strengths and enhance cur current school environments to create optimum conditions for learning. And certainly safety falls into that. Right. I guess I was just asking if this is a strategic plan that we're reporting out to the public, right. what else is right. in that piece? Because I was on there today, the strategic plan, and yeah. looked at the minutes and for both, both of those two yeah. committees, and there's a plethora of information. Right. And I just didn't, I either right. didn't remember, which is quite We don't even, we don't have an official committee for it. And okay. that's probably the next piece we need to do is, we've kind of tied the bow on these two, is what's right. our next charge to do. Okay. The other Perfect. thing I know that came up that I just remembered as well is, what do we offer for students after school? I know even through our budget time that certain principals want to be able to offer stuff for students to stay after school. Um, mm -hmm. Instead of everybody running to the Wyndham Public Library or on the playground um, across the street, you know, those are structures that could be in place to help mm -hmm. enhance the optimal learning of our children. So, yeah, no, I'm not badgering. I just yep. didn't understand what the next step is yep. for that and how it's what that looks I'd like. I'd be happy to look into that and start like, what's our next charge with this? What do we feel we need to look at for those kiddos? Perfect. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next we have the report of the secretary. Somebody could make a motion for the minutes. I okay. move to approve the amended minutes of the January 3rd, 2018 meeting. Second. All those in favor? It's unanimous. I move to approve the minutes of the January 31st, 2018 meeting. I second. All those in favor? It's unanimous. You're doing so well. Keep going. <laughs> I move to approve the minutes of the January 12th, 2018 meeting. February. Second. February. Second. All those in favor? You were doing so well. I have been doing so well. She, she got flustered. She made me. <laughs> I know. She screwed she me. She distracted you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving along to committee like, oh, yeah, reports. <laughs> You're on TV. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> committee reports. Um, have I you met, had any yeah, meetings? Yeah, I actually met with both um, Mr. Nash with the adult ed. Oh, good. Um, kind of informal. I hadn't really been in and seen, you know, their little area and, and what they do, so I just really got to kind of see their area and get a little tour and, and talk with him. Um, so that's pretty exciting. I, I have to say I didn't – they really um, – 
in this sort of nice, quiet way are really doing a lot for our community, and it's really, really cool to see, and I, I'm, I'm excited that we are able to support them in that. Um, so that's really cool. I also met with um, the folks over at the Katahdin School as well. Okay. Um, they're working on, so their grant is a three-year three <coughs> cycle, um, and they're coming up where they have to resubmit, so they're working on that, and they have some really uh, excellent ideas and, and things that they want to uh, be able to uh, work with our schools and our students on. Um, so more info on that to come because it's I, I think they have the the potential to be really impactful and, and do some really awesome stuff so good cool. no meeting in uh, February okay next meeting is March okay which is that's tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> right uh, facilities will be meeting coming right up next Wednesday, next Wednesday so there was no <laughs> meeting in February and as far as the shared vehicle there was no meeting uh, for February as well okay are you able to give a little blurb um, well finance committee has not met um, and no meetings are scheduled at this point um, the superintendent evaluation uh, form committee did meet um, Eric or two of the members uh, Eric and I had a chance to go through a lot of uh, research information that we had gathered and uh, there's a lot of commonalities um, throughout the different states we looked at you know representative samples um, from several several states and there's a lot of commonalities and the neat thing about it is it um, the, f the form that we've selected which is pretty common now is that it is very similar to how we're evaluating our students and also how we're evaluating our teachers uh, with a format so we've kind of selected a format and now we're working on the substance of you know measures that match up with the superintendent's job description and uh, and what we feel is important for uh, you know superintendent to accomplish so um, we're working independently, the members of the committee, and then we're going to meet again, hopefully next week, and uh, you know, kind of compare our information and whittle it down. So, perfect. That's that. Ms. Briggs. Oh. Do you have um, graduation policy. Um, our two illustrious administrators who are in the audience this evening inform me that. Um, we're a little bit on hold, waiting for more information um, from the state. Um, so that's on hold, but we're going to move forward, meeting with grading and up regarding grading and reporting. And it has been suggested to include um, Drew and Randy in those discussions um, with the thought that perhaps there might be a dialogue about um, a grading system that would enhance transition from middle schools to high school so there might be some commonality perhaps for example eighth grade through to the ninth grade so that we'll be discussing that um, mr hell has recommended we meet regarding the tobacco policy um, and he's going to be gathering research on that uh, vaping has become bigger and bigger not only at the high school level, but apparently it's also at the middle school level. And though we had revised our policy for vaping, um, apparently th we need to tighten it up even further um, to make it work for the district. And the facilities use policy, um, we're finalizing that draft, after which we will meet with the constituents that presented to us some time ago to inform them of the recommended changes. Prior to meeting with them, you will be getting a draft copy of that so that you will know um, what we're recommending. In fact, we probably should, should we do that first before we meet with them? Good idea. Um, because I'd hate to tell them what we're doing and you guys haven't signed off on it. So, I mean, you're kind of important, yeah, so we'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't wanna get in trouble. And then the distribution, um, I sent out the minutes to that, distribution of um, non-school materials mm -hmm. where we had recommended status quo for that policy. Um, 
and we've had some dialogue with those folks too and hope to meet with them again just to reiterate our go forward plan and as i mentioned in the minutes um, we still are very willing and will continue to be um, providing the monthly up monthly blurb with the different um, towns libraries recs um, listserv addresses for folks to um, seek other information for outside activities and that's it my update's kind of old because we the finance committee met uh, the very end of January, um, but I'll give you our little update. So we quickly revisited the student laptop program. Um, since we met the first time and talked about the changes that took place in that program, that it's now not uh, an insurance program anymore, it's self-funded. A letter went out to all the RSU families with that updated information. And we have in-house Mike Duffy, which, what is his title? Um, school Safety and Security Support Specialist. Okay. <laughs> wow. That's, why That's a mouthful. That's why I didn't remember yeah. that. Um, so he's overseeing a majority of that program. He's the SS. And he is also assisted by Jeff Vermet from Jeff Vermet and Associates, who is working with us on that new endeavor. Um, I also just gave some a lot of more information in my notes that I'll be sending to you folks about the number of people. We have um, 1,524 families that have paid for that program, and that's um, grades 4 through 12. We have 364 families who have opted out and 287 families that re receive a reduced fee who qualify for the free and reduced meal program, so they pay a reduced fee. We also have nine scholarship families. So then we had a, a brief update about the food services. Um, Scott asked for a, a current number on where we were at with the unpaid balances. When we met in December, that number was approximately $4,100. And um, our meeting time into January, that has already grown to $6,300 oh. approximately. Yes. Um, Jeannie was not there. We just asked for that number so we can monitor. Mm -hmm. The other thing that she did bring to our attention is there is a bill being proposed, LD 1684, which is an act forbidding food shaming, food denial, and the use of food as discipline involving any child in Maine public schools. And unfortunately, if that bill is successful, that's going to further hinder our efforts to collect any unpaid balances. Um, and she wrote a, a very persuading letter to the committee that is uh, reviewing that, mm -hmm. saying that she would not be for that at all. Like I said, we, we already have an issue, and then that, that's going to further hinder our efforts, because then why would people pay it all? Um, so the biggest chunk of our meeting was budget discussions. So since then, you folks have had the, the joint meeting with the A-team, where you've heard these the same numbers that I can give you now. Um, on the preliminary ED-279 information that we received from the state, we are looking at losing approximately a million dollars in funding. And there are several reasons for that change. Um, one of them is that our district has seen a 5% increase in state valuations versus <laughs> the state average of 2%. Um, and our pupil count has remained flat. So that impacts the amount of monies that we received. There's also been a reduction in the state allocation for system administration. And our district continues to have to pay, and everybody has to pay a larger percent of the retirement monies. So all those things have greatly impacted us. And also just some changes that have happened in the funding. Um, the state is looking at changing the way we fund the career and technical education. Um, they're looking at sending those funds directly to the schools instead of um, to the sending schools. That change, though, is going to require new legislation, so that hasn't taken effect yet. But those monies were not put in the ED 279. 
And also just to let everybody know that the cost sharing formula for 2019 is going to be calculated on the average of each member municipality's valuation over the past three years. So that's what our go forward is going to be. And Don, do you know those figures, the percentages? No. I'm sorry, what percentages? For the cost sharing going forward. For the internal the cost new? sharing? The new. The new. I'm pretty sure I'm you did throw those out. Wasn't it 31? Right. Ours bit. dropped more. Um, I, I forget what it was. I didn't bring it, it, so I'd rather no, just send right. it to you by email. No, yeah. that's fine. Thank you. I, I'll get it yeah. for okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then we also elected a new chair, which is Pete. Congratulations, Yay. Pete. <laughs> so that's, that's pretty much it, and I'll send these out. Oh, and Sandy, did you have an update? A couple things. Um, I had the good fortune to watch the basketball game last Friday night at the Cross Civic Center and uh, Wyndham played uh, Lewiston, and it was a great game. A ton of parents from Wyndham and Raymond were there. Uh, were really great spirit. We did lose the game, but I thought we had great sportsmanship, and I thought they played a very excellent game. Um, and I think it's back 1966 was the last time the basketball team made it to the regionals. So kudos to the boys for doing a great job. And also, just for the public to know, starting next week, we will be having budget present presentations uh, from each cost center throughout the month of March, and I'll be presenting the budget next week, and just really would encourage any um, public participation throughout the budget process as a good way to really understand the total budget, because each cost center is uh, an opportunity to hear what's in their budget, and it really breaks down the budget for people to understand. So if you can at least attend or watch, I would encourage you. The uh, schedule for that is on the website as well. But if you cannot find it, uh, give us a call and we'll be happy to assist. That's it, thank you. Do you have any updates on the SEA? Yeah. Um, so the regionalization, it's really grown from the Sebago Alliance to most of the Cumberland County towns have some real interest to look at regionalization. Kind of dabbing, putting their toe in, trying to learn more about it. What are the opportunities where we could collaborate together? So the facilitators have scheduled a meeting for March 14th to have hopefully a board member or two to attend with myself um, the next meeting to really break down what we've been doing and where we're going and we need to make a final decision by April I believe so there's a lot of energy um, people are really excited I think most of the towns not all but I would say there's at least 10 districts that are very excited to think of some opportunities to regionalize. So um, we'll have more, I think, after that meeting <coughs> when we meet at the folk school with the board members. Okay. So if anybody's interested, Kate was going to attend that meeting. It is in the morning. It's at 7.30. It's at 7.30? Mm -hmm. oh. oh, it's early. Get um, up at 5. So <laughs> if anybody's interested, let me know if you'd like to be the person that attends You'd that. I, I believe it's March 14th, but I can let you know. It is the 14th. Is it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, we, we need so somebody from the board. Okay. In Westport. Where is it? Westport? Vo vocational. Cafe. I should know where that is, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Maybe. Round table? Anything? Anything you'd like to add? I'll start that way. No, I can't think of anything right now. I got nothing. No, thank you. Well, I'll just share. Um, Kate and I attended the breakfast. It's, it's really fun, actually, to go and see the students and see what's going on in the high school. So it's just Kate and I that showed up. 
I can't think of the teacher's name. It was a science teacher, and the kids were showing us um, projects that they had worked on where they had to pick a particular cancer to research. And the most interesting part is they brought in Natalie to help them with the computer That's great. and the presentation. And I, don't, I can't remember what the program was called, but it was really cool. It actually flipped like a book. And um, the librarian was also there to tell us her piece in teaching the kids how to research properly. So the kids presented their projects. And the best part is they were so engaged. And they, you know, they even said that, that they had a, a good time. One of the kids said that the best part for him was doing the research. He totally enjoyed the research. So they clearly got a lot out of it. And it was great to see all of our expensive technology being used and meeting Natalie and seeing what she does and how impactful that was for that, that teacher. She said she could never have pulled that off without her help. Um, mm -hmm. She has a, an assistant in her classroom, but still she needed all those other folks to help her to, to pull that off. And the kids were very proud of their work. So, If I might add, the thing that was so interesting for me, and you've captured it exceedingly well, but um, there were two, two things that I came, well, there was a lot that I came away with, but two things. First of all, the amount of effort and work that the classroom teacher and Natalie and the librarian put in prior to the lesson to set this all up on the computer for these students with resources and how it, it was astonished. I, I was blown away with the pre-planning for this lesson. But the bigger takeaway for me was um, it wasn't until after the students had left and each two, there were four students, each were entirely engaged. It was incredible. I mean, one did um, cancer of the, I don't know, there were four, pancreas. Mm. And, but the bottom line for me was I had no idea that these students were academic level. And the quality of work that they produced blew me away and the engagement um, it was it was very moving yeah, it really it was. was so anyway That's hope great. you can make the next yeah, one it was yeah, fabulous it was awesome. yeah March? Um, nothing Anna? I, I do um, Friday evening we are welcoming our group of Japanese students back again this year she sure, we have 27 coming. Um, wow. And just an interesting side note, one is a boy. So we have 26 <laughs> girls coming and one boy. Um, so you'll see them around uh, the high school. They'll, they're all shadowing with different students. I think they might be doing a day at the middle school. I don't remember for sure. Um, so <laughs> look how for them. They'll be around. How long they hello. Hello. Nine days. They come for nine whole days. They fly like 20 hours. Mm -hmm and stay for nine days. Um, they're very tired, we host one every year, and the first couple of days, is they're like in a fog, so it's pretty fun. <laughs> um, and also we have, uh, the high school also has one acts coming up as well. I believe this weekend is a preview. Mm -hmm. I might be off by a weekend, but I think it's this weekend. It is. Because um, I can't understand that it's March tomorrow, so uh, that's available at the high school this weekend before they head off for their competitions. Okay. Did you have anything? Um, yeah, I think the high school has been pretty good, except for the fact that the front door doesn't work. <laughs> um, oh, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely been an obstacle. But um, there was also talk about a potential school walkout in March. I think you know more about that than I do. There's a um, back committee meeting tomorrow on that to kind of discuss that. So I'm not sure dates are whatever, but there has been a lot of talk um, within the students all over the country, and so I think that's good that we are talking about that. Um, and prom themes are being decided, which is mm. fun. Um, <laughs> to go dress shopping soon. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so we have like Great Gatsby, so like the 20s, and then some sort of like spring floral, I believe. So yeah, it's exciting. Thanks. Thank you. For me. <laughs> all right. Then I guess that wraps it up. If I could have a motion. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Good evening.